This program is dedicated to Brother Hannibal Tyrus Afrique, also known as Harold East Charles III. I once knew a man by Brother David Hall. On my journey through life and on the path to manhood, I once knew a man who quietly embodied the values of African manhood. He was gentle but strong, wise and humble, deeply committed to his people, yet a citizen of the world. I once knew a man who served his people at the altar of his ideals. He loved family and worked to build a nation. He treasured principles, but was not a slave to them. He was obedient enough to submit to his calling, but courageous enough to continuously question the path. This tall, slender, and stately teacher of mind and culture bridged the worlds of public education and institution building. He knew that education would not ultimately save and serve our people unless it was encased in sacred cultural vessels that reflected the history, values, and vision of our people. He founded and built the Shule Yawatoto from heart, blood, sweat, and dreams. He kept this dream alive during periods of great social protest and in silent winters when no one appeared to care. But there was never any doubt about whether he cared. He cared with his broad smile, wrinkled hands, and his impeccable integrity and character. I once knew a man who reflected African values in his life and not just in his words. He understood the synergistic power of culture and spirit. He realized that the God of his people was a force of liberation and love. He worshiped God in his own image. He knelt at his own altar and prayed in his own language. I once knew a man who embraced me as a brother, father, and mentor. We signed no agreement. I didn't enroll in any program. His words, work, and spirit enlisted my loyalty and inspired my life. The generosity of his spirit served as a bridge that permitted me to connect my work as a government lawyer and my desire to serve my people. He, along with so many other brothers and sisters of the African community of Chicago, were my anchor in the vast sea of meaning and purpose. I once knew a man who was royally black. In a world where African manhood is still challenged, falsified and sold to the highest bidder, it is a blessing to know an authentic man. We cross paths in a whisper, but the whirlwinds of our crossing still guide me to this day. And the winds of my people's future will be ushered in by the spirit of men like brother Hannibal, Tyrus Afrique, Harold E. Charles III, Sister Jamila Barbara Agnelli will take us further. A tribute to Hannibal Afrique, master teacher and institution builder. We, the Belozi Wazi Council of Elders, Shuliwawa Toto, have been truly honored to seek Baba Hannibal's wise counsel and to receive his unyielding leadership. During the many years that we presented Kwanzaa at the Malcolm X College, he trained and instilled each of us as community elders and gave Africa dames to MZ Amanita Short, MZ Amina Mayo, MZ Kamban Johnson, MZ Sonia Najwa, MZ Kalanji Pates, MZ Ayoka Savanhu, M.C. Natambu Johnson, and M.C. Kuumba o John uh, Johnson, who made her transition in March. He commissioned us to be guardians of the culture, the tradition, and the history of African people, and to serve as a link between the past and present. According to the sacred Hosea, our esteemed leader has qualified for the highest of human qualities and spiritual divinity. His many scholarly works have awakened African people at home and abroad. His message mandated by the ancestors resonates with us today. He said nation building should be the only reason for our existence 
individually and collectively. How can we call ourselves nationalists and we have still failed to create a model of new communities? It's not about Hannibal, pro or con. It's about doing the work of building a sovereign new African nation state in our lifetime. Anything else is hypocrisy, deception and collaboration with the, our hysterical enemies. I do not intend to come promise on the principles and values of nation building. When you have chastised me to slow down, my response has always been, I'll step back when others step up. He devoted the past 50 years to his life, of his life to the black liberation struggle. Now he joins with our ancestors, our African warriors who preferred liberation over subjugation. May he take his rightful place with the Creator and ancestors. Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, Queen Mother Moore, Brother Malcolm X, Sister Harriet Tubman, and others. When libations are offered by the Belosi Wazi Council of Elders, his name will be called and our request for blessings will be granted as we give honor and praise to the spiritual memory of Baba Hannibal Taurus Afri, our founding elder, who Africanized, nationalized, and revolutionized black people and paved the way for a sovereign new African nation state, we pour and say libation. Now that he is our revered ancestor, we can rejoice in his tradition, in his transition, for indeed he has demonstrated good speech and deep thought, which will remain in our consciousness for as long as the sun shines and the waters flow. In the final analysis, we believe with him, Pamoja to Chashende, together we will win. Hotep. Hotep. Hannibal E. Charles III, Baba Hannibal Tyrus F. Freak, June 5th, 1934, June 27th, 2011. And I have with me also, and very happy to greet you, Dr. Harold Pates and Rashid Akbar. Very, very happy to have you here to talk about your relationship and your reflections on the life of Baba Hannibal, Dr. Pates. Yes, I think uh, the antecedent remarks that you made and Sister Jamila um, characterized him perfectly because I, I knew him a long time. As a matter of fact, I met him back in the 60s. Uh, when he was a teacher at Farragut High School and um, he was working in Operation Push, uh, working with uh, uh, Operation Breadbasket at that time, working with uh, a group called Black Men Moving. And it's interesting to watch that transformative process. Um, I can remember Brother Lou Palmer used to always say, that's enough to make a Negro turn black. Well, after uh, Brother Hannibal taught as he did, I think the teaching, you speak of synergy, the reciprocity between the teacher and the student, and the student and the teacher, began to um, impose upon him a need to understand that what was going on in the school system as such was not really education of African, uh, African and African American people. And I choose to say African people because after all, our African American people are African people. Um, and an, a so-called schooling without systemic value teaching is not education, it's training. So he realized that, and as he began to transform, he began to understand and reinforce his own identity to the extent that he actually became somewhat a priest in the generic culture of African people. Uh, he was installed, and as a result of that installment, I won't say as a result of that installment, but I will say um, the installment, I think, took him to an entirely different 
emotional, spiritual, and intellectual level. And I think it's because of the kind of imposing spirit that he had, that he was so effective in, in imposing the African image on those with whom he came into contact. When Hannibal came in the room, you had to deal with his presence. Before he spoke, you had to deal with his presence. You had to ask yourself, where am I in relationship to where he is? The man was, <clears throat> um, he had studied and he became sometimes naturally as scholars study more and more, they become a, a little bit impatient uh, with transmitting um, what they know to those who don't know. Reflections on the life of an icon, Baba Hannibal Tyrus Afrique, also known as Harold E. Charles III. Brother Rashid, you have done many, many wonderful things in our community, always in line and in harmony with our culture. And most recently, you did a benefit for Baba Hannibal and for Baba Okoro Harold Johnson at Malcolm X College. And I was very pleased that you allowed me to be your mistress of ceremonies. And while I was reading the piece that we introduced this program with, I turned from the audience and saw that he was on Skype, that he was looking at me. And I had the very feeling that Dr. Pates just uh, described, how you see yourself in relationship to him. The moment you came into his presence, there was a sort of aura or an energy that surrounded you. And it was not um, the uh, relaxed, informal uh, familiarity. It was, there was such a, uh, an element of respect, such a willingness to listen and to, and to hear. How did you come to do that particular benefit? What was your relationship to Baba Hannibal? I originally met uh, MZ uh, Baba Hannibal back in, in the mid-1960s. I played basketball with Crane High School and he was a school teacher at Farragut on the west side of Chicago. I was so impressed with him. Then when I finally had the opportunity to meet him, he began to talk to me about you, you have some talent with basketball, but maybe that's not your final calling. And he began to inspire me. Even though I was playing basketball and considered doing well, I was considered at that time probably be one of the best basketball players in Chicago. But that wasn't to be my destiny. Baba Hannibal began to mold my thinking. When he was born on the planet, he came here as spirit that was not to be limited to a Pan-African nationalist. He was a spirit to come here to raise the consciousness of all of us. And he was a perfect example. So when I heard about his medical condition, I wanted to do everything. I felt like he was my father. I felt like he was my brother. He was my mentor. And I felt it was a duty and an obligation that I had to do the best I could to knock it out conscious. Here were two men who gave their life for years and years to our community. At least we should have had the respect to come out and to say thank you while he was alive. And, and those who came out who didn't come, you know, God is the best to know about the, you know, about the people that did not come. And that could have been for multiple reasons. But Baba Hannibal and Bova Okuro was deserving of our show of appreciation. We let too many of our scholars, too many of our elders come through here and make transitions. And when they need us in those critical moments, we are not there. So I think that's the next stage of our development as an Afric-centric community that we got to realize, as uh, Jose said at, his, uh, at, the, at the ceremony, that we got to take care of our elders a little bit better than what we've been doing. And that's a duty and an obligation. And Baba trained us in this. He trained us because he was an example how he dealt with elders. He was an example how he dealt with children. And he did it so skillfully. He did it with humbleness and he did it with 
vision. He was a strategic leader. When he named himself after three African kings, Hannibal, Tyrus, or Freak, he knew he played the role of all three of those kings. So his life and his character and his personality was mold after them. And he tried to instill that back into us. He loved children. People know very little, because we know a lot about Baba Hammer with Kwanzaa. That man was a scholar and, and a scientist in biology. And a lot of times those things will never be told unless we go and continuously to tell his story. He was more than Baba Hannibal, who was an integral part of, of the Kwanzaa celebrations here in Chicago and around the world. That man touched the lives of masses of people. Him and his wife would travel on the bus way from the south side, way to the west side, to make sure the shoelace ran properly and that he gave our children an alternative to what we may even consider the public school system. In certain cases, I'm not criticizing teachers or anything, but to, to the level of education that Baba Hannibal provided for the community, if those who chose to send their children, and even if they didn't send their children, they were still influenced. Because a lot of people who sat at his feet, myself and many others, have went on with his work. So those who thought they escaped the shoelace still got the shoelace anyway, and that's the power that no walls could contain him. His death in the grave will not contain his spirit. His spirit will continue to work in me, all the other, everybody who loved him and, and his family. And my heart goes out to his family. Only thing I can say to Baba, I will work hard with his daughter, Teresa, and, 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 and Baba Hannibal's organization, what he wants for the youth. And I will get the same type of dedication to that as I gave to him when he was alive with us on the planet. Well, don't think you've made your final statement because there's more to be said. <laughs> I know that Charles Huey uh, said that he had a class with Baba Hannibal. Would you like to tell us something about your re recollection of that experience? Yes. In 1994, uh, I was to graduate from Northeastern, but they saw fit to not because I did not have, well, they said it was an up-to-date biology uh, critics. So just at that time, I don't know how it worked, how it happened, but uh, Dr. Hannibal came on the scene and he taught biology that year. And I found him to be quite an amazing instructor, and but one of the best that I have known in my life of going to school. And that his coming there to teach, I could maybe I don't know if it was a prayer of mine, <laughs> but it enabled me to graduate the following uh, year thereafter. But uh, I would say that uh, he made a definite mark on my life, and his method of teaching brought life to the class that he was teaching, which was biology, which uh, you don't get at a lot of places and a lot of individuals who are instructors. Uh, but uh, I can say that he will be most missed, but uh, I'm most appreciative that I got to cross paths with him in this lifetime. I can't even remember where I first met him. All I know is that everywhere I was that mm -hmm. had something to do with our community, our culture, he was there. Mm -hmm. I do remember though being, being at a church in Chatham when he was leading the struggle for community control because at that time we had the situation that we ca have currently the schools were a political football. People just used them. Businesses made money providing services and products. But education, as Dr. Pates has pointed out, was woefully lacking, not because of the teachers, but because the teachers were not able to teach the children because they, they, didn't, they themselves were not free. And when I say that, I mean that very, not mm -hmm. literally, virtually, I mean the teachers were so bogged down with filling out forms 
a major part of your day was consumed with clerical duties. So you gave students assignments, page 22 in the social studies book, page 5 in the spelling book, page 10 in the math book, in order to be able to meet that obligation. Because if your reports were not into the office on time, you would get a visit from the principal. Then your rating, your job, your family, all dependent upon your meeting these obligations. So teachers have a really difficult time trying to find instructional time for their students. And consequently, the students suffer. But all of this is because the schools are not controlled by the communities in which the schools Correct. exist. Correct. And Hannibal saw that and perhaps was the reason why this particular meeting was convened, but I went to it. And I rem that's my earliest memory, is we were talking about quality education. And the question was, would community control lead to quality education? And when it was his turn to speak on that panel, he stood as tall as any tree in any forest and said, yes community control does lead to quality education and pointed out that the non-black community had control of their schools and their children were getting a quality education. My chest went out as far as it, I, I was proud of a person who would take an unflinching stand, not leave us wavering on whether or not parents and and uh, other adults in the community knew how to run a school. That was not a question for him. The question, the question had to do with who should have the final say on the education of the children. Mm -hmm. And he said it should rest with the community and he led that fight and I joined that fight. And I respected him because he had integrity. He was not wishy-washy, he was not on this page one day and on that page another day. And all of us had jobs, let's say. All of us could face the firing squad of the Board of Education. Hannibal stood on his principles while at the same time maintaining a level of excellence that if you took him down, you'd have to explain why. So you learned how to fight from Hannibal. You learned that you couldn't come into the classroom half-stepping, that you had to be fully, fully informed about the subject matter that you were teaching. At that time, I think I may have been teaching at Harrison High School when he was at Farragut. You had to be fully informed, very knowledgeable about the subject matter that you were teaching. And you had to cross all the T's, dot all the I's. You couldn't have any uh, disciplinary problems. You know, you had to be punctual. He, he was, because he had served, I think, in the service, he was a very disciplined person. He was where he said he was going to be, when he said he was going to be there. So he was very, uh, very uh, 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 astute about maintaining discipline. So he taught you that if you were going to struggle, if you were going to fight, and you were going to, do it, going to do it effectively, you could not give people in authority ammunition to take you down. Mm -hmm. They couldn't say that you were you know, a mediocre teacher. They couldn't say that you were missing in action too often, you know, that you were coming in late, that you were taking too many days off. They, you couldn't give them reason. They'd have to come for you for the reasons, their real reasons, and their real reason had to be that you were a person of principle and you were fighting for the principles in which you believed. Hannibal led that fight, and very often, when he was somewhere speaking or when they were paying some kind of tribute to him, I would always take a stand and say, if you admire this man, support his work. Mm -hmm. That's how you show your admiration. When I saw him in that cavernous building on the west side where the Shule had residence, I was, I was somewhat, uh, well, let's say I was a little concerned because I knew that the utility bills would have to be astronomical. This was a building that I think the diocese 
no longer wanted to maintain. Correct. Hannibal was not afraid of that. Hmm. He walked into that building, he took those children in there, and he'd say to the children, and I know Barbara can attest to this because she was with the Shule, what are we going to do today? And the children would answer, we are going to do black things today meaning that they were going to be student-centered, African-centered before there was even a term for it. No one was saying African-centered mm -hmm. education. Hannibal was doing African-centered mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. And he was a scientist. He was a teacher of the sciences. And co consequently, he was not just over there, you know, they weren't just drawing pictures of people in African uh, dress or, you know, learning a few Swahili words, um, doing Kwanzaa. They were doing hard work because he wanted for those children what he wanted for all the rest of us. So this is the kind of man you would have to respect because he lived, he practiced what he mm -hmm. preached and mm -hmm. he lived according to the value, value system, before there was an Nguzo Saba, mm -hmm. Hannibal mm -hmm. was living according to an Nguzo Saba. You know, yeah. these people come up with these terms mm -hmm. and this vocabulary mm -hmm. and all these things that we should do. Hannibal had been doing these things for years, and he had been doing them with less help than he should have had. And I know this to be true, because during that period, I also became principal of a black private school, which was very well uh, taken care of. You know, people, parents who wanted to be bourgeois would pay tuition so that their children could get a bourgeois education. Mm -hmm. But they didn't understand what is called black nationalism. I don't, care to call it nationalism, I just ca care to call it self-centered mm -hmm. education, child-centered education, which is what every parent in their right mind would want for their child exactly. if they mm -hmm. knew. Exactly. So that's the, that's the Hannibal I knew. And even in his, in the days when his health was in decline, he was still writing letters. I went to the service and he, he was writing letters to people and, and, you know, and setting the record straight and making them understand that we, rather than try to get him to slow down, as Barbara has said, we needed to step up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we weren't stepping up. I'm no, I'm no less, I'm no more innocent than anybody else is. I'm just saying that you're right Rashid, when you say that here was a person, a real model, not a role model, here's a person who is sh giving us a road map of how to be in the world as African descendants. Mm -hmm. And not only a model, we talk about an energy that has transcended race. He was a model for any ethnic group. He was an ideal husband. He was an ideal father. He was an ideal community leader. Everything you would want for any person, regardless of race or religion. He was an example for everybody. He was put here to be more than what we tried to contain him in. And he raised the bar mm -hmm. and for all, on all of us. All of mm -hmm. us who thought we were conscious, all of us was doing our work in the community, he raised the bar. Mm -hmm. He said, you can do more, because mm -hmm. then you're the, you're the greatest thing on earth. Mm -hmm. You were given dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, mm -hmm. and everything that creepeth upon the face of the earth. And if you was given that type of power, then that's exemplified because the greatness is in us. And he mm -hmm. called on us, and he never let us rest. Why? Was he just saying, okay, you should do this, Dr. Peace, you should do this, Rashid, you should do this. No, he lived the life. The Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, you could be there all day trying to tell the dirty glass is dirty when all you have to do is sit a clean glass beside the dirty glass and the dirty glass immediately knows it needs to clean itself up. Mm -hmm. Baba Hannibal set a clean glass next to us mm -hmm. and he made us look at him like about Dr. Pace was saying, when you come in his presence, he was the model, he was the, the way you wanted to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you would have given <coughs> the aspirations you wanted to do. And he didn't say things that, oh, be like me. He never said that, he did the work. And because we saw him, because innately in us, 
We are good human beings. And the, our society, our school system, would hate to see a institution like the Shule rise and, and be a, a model for masses. Why? Does crime pay? Yes, it does. Shule was, was stopping people from going to penitentiary. Shule was stopping people from joining jails. Uh, they charge $100,000 when an inmate goes to jail. That hundred, then that just uh, uh, insured by Payne Weber for another 250000 Then that's put on Wall Street as a national security, traded not by the general public, traded by international banks around the world. Most people don't even know their loved ones are being traded on Wall Street. Papa Hannibal had that wisdom. So he was trying to keep us off of Wall Street in that capacity, as he was saying, a commodity. Mm -hmm. And that's what they have reduced to them. Papa Hannibal said, no, you're more than that. You're great. Sisters, you're more than just an African queen. Everything we see on the planet, even all the mach machinery here, was created by the mind of a male or a female. Had to come by route of a womb of a woman. And Baba mm -hmm. Hannah was knocking at the conscience of all our young ladies and all our adult women. Rise up. You're not just the queen of Africa. You're the whole queen of the planet Earth. He raised the bar. And, he, and in raising the bar, he called a lot of us to work. And a lot of us <coughs> fell short. And uh, most of us have fallen short. This man had an unusual dedication, mm -hmm. an unusual level of integrity that he practiced. And he is still letting everybody. I say I'm going to do something. I'm going to keep my word. If I tell you I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there. And he was like that. And he wanted all of us to be like that. Not that he wanted us to be like him. This is what we all should be doing. And you know, you can't recall him ever not looking African. I don't know if he ever wore a tie. He may have, but I never saw him wear one. He all, you always thought of him as an African because he always carried himself mm -hmm. like an African so that he was not switching roles from you know from being this and being that to being something else he mm -hmm. was always in character because mm -hmm. that was who he was mm -hmm. so you know to to be able to read and uh, to meet an authentic person as as the the uh, tribute says an authentic person is just such a wonderful thing and the whole idea of taking care of our elders and I am now one of them and I'm trying to do a good job of taking care of myself and I see Barbara's doing a better job of taking care of herself <laughs> 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 but the, 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 the point is that we, we say this all the time and then we don't follow through when uh, Professor John Henry Clark I, I fussed at a time or two because it was clear that he was not taking care of himself. And um, I think sometimes these people are so consumed with the work. Mm -hmm. There's just yeah. so much, sometimes they just work themselves to death, mm -hmm. even though they get these other things along the way that you can name, like uh, Professor Clark was legally blind by the time he died. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ben Yakinen had all kinds of health challenges, mm -hmm. you know, Asa Hilliard left us way too soon, you mm -hmm. know, uh, didn't mm -hmm. survive uh, uh, an attack of, um, of, what's the thing that people get when they go to, to malaria. 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 Dr. Burroughs had malaria once or maybe twice before uh, and survived it. He, he did not survive it because he had a compromising uh, condition. But the thing is that the people who live with, the families that live with these people are always trying to get them to have the proper nutrition, to relax, to get some sleep, to get some exercise. But because there are so few, you know, there are so few of them. When you cited, you know, the struggle continues. Yes, the struggle continues. But the, the, what do they say? The harvest <coughs> is full, but the, the vineyard is full, but the okay, harvest is full. The labor is <coughs> full. That's the situation. So whenever you have these people who have vision and who, mm -hmm. have, who are in tune, who understand what is going on and know that they, it must be addressed, not just as a form of a complaint or a grievance, 
but you got to roll up your sleeves and you got to get involved. You got to go in somewhere and do something about this. Those kinds of people very often are applauded by us and we'll give them a plaque or an award or some recognition from time to time, but we won't labor with them. We don't go out. And so consequently telling them to take better care of themselves, mm -hmm. trying to give them wholesome food and all of that kind of stuff is never going to be sufficient mm -hmm. because what we have to do is get shoulder to shoulder with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that this audience has probably somebody that they treasure you know, in their home, in their church, in their school, in their block, somewhere around that they would like to see live a vital life, you know, be able to live life with some vitality, to be able to hear and see and speak and get around. But if you're not paying attention to the fact that these people, some of these people are busy working way too hard and you can lift that load by working with them mm -hmm. by understanding first of all just understanding what it is they're trying to do uh -huh. you know what what did we think that Hannibal was trying to do when he started the Shule Yawa Toto did we think that he was just stroking his ego that he had nothing better to do with his time he was married for over 37 years mm -hmm. you know he had four children and four grandchildren, he could have done the same things yeah. that all the rest of us do. He could have been, you know, just dealt with his family, you know, set his grandchildren on his knee, and nobody would have blamed him for that because that's what all the rest of us do. But instead, he took on the work that our community needs to do. And every time I see that kind of thing, every time I see it, I'm awed by it because I know that this is a choice that nobody is making any of these people do what they do, but they are doing it on our behalf. I would like to see a, a film made, not only just limiting it to, to, to uh, Baba Hannibal. You look at Oscar, you, we had so many theories. Why, with all this negative stuff that they've shown us on the, on the television, you know, why, why, why I hope and pray some filmmaker we have the vision to see you. So much greatness has come through our community. We don't need they to give us permission to create a film. Make a film. We will rent the theaters if necessary to show the movie. We got to see, we got to keep the struggle alive. Together we can do this. Okay. And, and we can make a film, begin to take it into schools, invite the schools, children out, whatever, with the lack of funds in the school, probably got to take it into the school because they probably can't bust them out to a movie theater. But our children, Hannibal's vision, Oscar's vision, and many other leaders we done had. I mean, we talking about unrelentless talent, unrelentless spirits. If we don't tell the story, mm -hmm. it'll never get told. told. It would be a shame that a young child one day, who was Barbara Hannibal? Who was Oscar Brown Jr.? We have to take that responsibility that we don't keep them alive. We can't say the government, Congress, didn't, the stimulus money didn't come down the pipe, so therefore we didn't have the money to do this. We gotta stop being the children of Lazarus, begging for some grant monies and that. We, the money we spend, the billions of dollars that the black community spend annually, if we had the wisdom to, just to see what Barbara Hanneman was trying to tell us, if we can take just a portion of this mm -hmm. and put back into our, the salvation and the control and the preservation of our own legacy, at least we should have the willingness to do that. And I, and I hope and pray that one day, and maybe God may push me to get into filmmaking. Because <laughs> I refuse to let, let the man's spirit and the Oscar and the spirit just, just go and touch it. That don't, make, that's, that don't make good common sense to me. Well, I, I think, you know, when I was a younger woman, we used to have a parents club. First, we had a mother's club and a father's club, and then we realized that that was not the most efficient way to do this. So we had a parents club. And the parents club was so that we could have something to do with the develop our children's development, you know, because you cannot just send your children to some place and have people doing something according so to some plan that they've devised and know what the product end product is going to be. You know, we wanted to know these people who were coming home to our houses every day, and, right. you know, these people <laughs> for whom we were responsible. Mm -hmm. So we had, we, we developed a, a, a parents club and we involved ourselves 
as a group in the 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 uh, the the uh, lives of the children in more ways than just discipline. You know, you have to do this or you have don't have to do that. But we were interested in their extracurricular activities, and so we started providing an ex extracurricular program for them that fit what our our ideas were for constructive child development. Now, it doesn't take a lot. To, we were in public housing doing this, in the projects. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to do that. If you got a group of parents anywhere, if they're in the church together, if they're in the projects together, if they're in the neighborhood together, mm -hmm. they need to form some sort of organization. And the organization needs to have in mind not how often the grass is cut, not how what you put in front of your house when it's Christmas time. You know, I've, I've been there in the in the block club scene where the most the, the people join it is so that they can tell other people how to maintain their property. This is not what you need because houses are underwater. So forget about that. You can just forget about <laughs> all of that stuff that people used to you used to devote their time to devote. Let's come together in groups. So, because individuals get quickly burned out and overwhelmed, but groups of people can make plans together and they can care for the children when they say it takes a village to mm -hmm. raise a child. Baba Hannibal knew that, mm -hmm. but he didn't have the support of the village. Sure did. So since the village didn't step up, he stepped up and I guess he caused those people who loved him to step up with him to work with him, but it was hard work. It was harder work because he had other people's children, not just his own children, right. but he had other people's children. And other, when people are taking care of your children, you ought to want to know and you ought to want to be involved. So True. at some point, I think we need to, these kinds of organizations need to be formed. I think maybe, you know, if I had a pulpit, I'd be calling it, calling making the call from my pulpit. I'd be saying, you know, we got a singles ministry and we got a, a prison ministry and we got a this kind of, let's get a children's ministry that has to do with the extracurricular uh, uh, activities yes. in which the children are engaged. Let's provide some outlet for the children. What do they have? You know, they, they, they don't, ha where do they go after school? Home? There are no boys and girls clubs. There may be a few, mm -hmm. few and far between, but there's not one that is convenient for every child yeah. to participate in. When they raised the, at the memorial service, and I forgot who there was, or Jamil was speaking, they held up the book that they, Hannibal wanted everybody to stand from the sovereign revolution. What was Hannibal having us to look at? What is a sovereign? What is a revolution? You know, and I think he was calling us to, how do we take back control? Like you said, the parents are coming mm -hmm. together, taking control of our children. When Bob Hannibal stood up at, at uh, Kwanzaa and had all the men stand up and talk about, it is a shame how this, our community has gotten to, to, to the place that we don't have no control, almost none whatsoever over our children. At that point, we went to work, like we met all day, me and Mr. Hugh and others, about a black youth, black credit union called you Savior Savings. Uh, people say, what do you mean a savior? If this child can turn around and inspire another child not to join a dysfunctional uh, youth organization, stay off crack cocaine, you know, develop their mind and their consciousness, he's become a savior to another child. Why a credit union versus a bank? A credit union belongs to the community. They have to give out loans. So what you're finna see soon, right now we got 26 states, children in 26 states. We're just a council of elders seeing that. And we got everybody, every Saturday, starting at one day, just Saturday, everybody taking seven children. I want you to have a personal relationship with those seven children in your home. And we're gonna teach what Barbara Hannibal taught us. We're doing this all over the state right now. And we're finna have, get, we're getting ready to have a youth <coughs> economic conference here in Chicago. And we're going to honor, this is what Baba was trying to get us to see. We don't need their permission to do anything. We are free. We are sovereign. This is a sovereign revolution. I truly understand what Baba Hannibal, we wait for others to give us some permission mm -hmm. to go and develop for something we can do for ourselves mm -hmm. and do it ourselves. 
And that's what Bible was calling us to. I choose to want to do it. I'm going to put a major call out. This is a state of emergency. If you say if this flood, if we look at Katrina, Haiti, and all the different catastrophes, that was devastating. Mm -hmm. But I asked everybody, look at the amount of children are dying from drive-by shooting in, in the inner cities of America, across America, and across the world. Way more than all those deaths that we serve from all those things. We surpassed that annually. That's how many children are dying. But we have become so lethargic and, uh, and just, just, we have become respectful. You know, or what mm. this is the everyday mm -hmm. thing we should, we, that mm. should, we should <coughs> accept. Uh, two weeks ago, right by my house, a young man, they jumped out of a car with hoods on, shot a young man. Then they walked up on him and began to, all of them began to shoot him in the head after that. He laid there for three hours. Three hours. He wouldn't have laid, he wouldn't have let no other ethnic group lay a child lay out there. I was watching the little children looking at the body and they would look up at the parents. This was devastating. You know that mother for three hours. She just looking at her child, laying in the hot sun, just laying down there on the concrete. They couldn't come out. No. It was dangerous. The tourist bus, a bunch of foreigners came from another country, jumped off, was taking pictures of the bodies. Ma'am, would you stop? Does this look like a zoo to you? This mother just lost her child, and y'all taking pictures? Police ain't saying nothing, but that's not, that's our responsibility. Baba was talking about monitoring our own communities. Mm -hmm. controlling what's going on mm -hmm. until we come up with an economic base and understand the sovereign revolution we're going to continue to see crime increase at an astronomical rate that they've never seen before in their life prisons are going to be filled substance abuse programs are going to be filled with us unless we stand up the bar is raised do we have the willingness the tools he left with the tools the tools is here we got everything to work with only thing on the table right now do we have the willingness to do what the Creator has put in all of us to do. And if, if we choose to do that, we'll win the fight. If we mm -hmm. don't, we're going to pass. Well, I'd like to see a class taught called Iconology, mm -hmm. the study of icons. And I'd like to put mm -hmm. for Baba Hannibal as one of them. Dr. Margaret Burroughs, of course, is another. Jacob H. Carruthers is another. And we can go on and on. Because I think we're going to lose these images if we don't perpetuate them. And the only way that they can be perpetuated, as I see it, is that they've got to be codified. They've got to be solidified. They've got to be somewhere it, that it can't be just perhaps next June that somebody will remember the anniversary of his birth, you know, and maybe there'll be some sort of little uh, reception or ceremony. We have, we've got to, you say he raised the bar, well, we've got to keep, we've got to keep the standard mm -hmm. before them. Mm -hmm. How will they, how, it's easy to lapse back into the budget crisis or some other, uh, you know, shenanigans that are going on. It's easy to lose sight of what is real and what is vital and important in the world if there is not some conscious effort to make certain that these things become indelible. And so, you know, there are people who are in this audience that I know have the wherewithal to do things. So I'm sitting here saying, we need to do this sort of thing. We need to, if you didn't know Baba Hannibal Tyrus Afrique, you need to learn Baba Hannibal Afrique. You need to find out as much about him as you possibly can so that you can pass it on to others who might D indeed decide that that's a course that they'd rather take rather yeah. than the course of down the wrong path that will lead us to be commodities in somebody's penal institution. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of work to do and Baba Hannibal did more than his share so we should have less but because we didn't do our share it's, it still <laughs> remains for us to do it. And I know that you know the younger people will probably need to become involved sooner and I like the idea that you talk about a credit union. I was delighted when I found there was a black credit union in Chicago, the Southside Community Federal Credit Union. When I They had been there for eight years and I didn't know that they existed. I was thrilled beyond belief because there, I mean the money is going to be green is going to be governed by the same regulations that other institutions, financial <coughs> institutions, are governed by. So there's not going. To, there's no fear that if you put your money in an institution that is controlled 
and and run by by our own people that you it's going to be at greater risk than it will be in the institutions that are now running off with all the money yeah greg right. has done a wonderful job matter of fact that's who we're working through with this oh you do union. know him mm -hmm. and miss johnson yes. is the founder of of the south side federal credit union she's the one brought greg on board and she's the one with me and mr huey meant to be been meeting and planning laying this all across the nation mm -hmm. how we every great leader from Marcus Garvey, Malcolm, Elijah, everybody always said if we could just pool our resources together, together, we would have a leveraging power to do some wonderful works. Since the adult choose not to want to do that work, we're gonna take the babies and do it with the children. Leverage y'all money. And then we are loan then loan it back to the adults. Since the adults need help, the children are loaning even and that's how they do. Then and maybe somebody will build another shoelace. Exactly. A shoelace right. Yawa Toto. And Barbara can come back and be headmistress. That's correct. Mm. <laughs> would you, Jamila, would you consider, would you work in that setting again? Do you think? I know that you probably. But you know, I was never involved with the Shule. Okay. Why is it that they named you as having connection with Shule Yawa Toto I'm, on I'm, this I'm order of service? I'm with the service? Council of Elders. I'm with the Belozi Wazi. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the Belozi Wazi was the Council of Elders that were like the board of directors At for some other school. I came school. on after after that. You came on after, after that. After the, the, the Shule was defunct, you know, they stopped. What was the function of the Council of Elders? Uh, at that time, the, the Council of Elders uh, worked with the was the elders for the children. They worked there with the children at the Shule. Okay, that's what they did. Okay, so we need, you know, we do need that. We do need, there needs to be some authority that can speak on matters of importance to our community. And of course, it has to be an authority that the community recognizes. So if you have to have subsets of authorities, like the people over here will only listen to these people, that's fine. Okay. But there's got, there's got to be somewhere where the buck stops. You know, people going off in all sorts of directions, doing whatever they feel like doing, when they feel like doing it, will not be the way to anything called victory or liberation right. or anything that is desirable for us to have as a people. And we have to stop looking for that one individual, with that, mm -hmm. the Messiah type of thing, looking for a Messiah to come save us. We, are, we need not a leader, we need a leadership, a ship of leaders. And hmm. innately, we have a lot of people that are very talented. How do we weave them together, you know, to work in a harmonious fashion that we can get some serious work done? You know, and I think right now, our community has been conditioned by, the, by outside factors. When there's an issue in the community, there are only certain people they're, caught, they're gonna call on, and they'll be out front in the media. Not that they're not they're going to, they're doing good things. You look at Father, Father Flegger, you look at Minister Farrakhan, Reverend Jackson, Al Sampson, these are the one. But you got a lot of people behind the scenes doing some serious work that never get sure. recognized for the work that they're doing. People would know about Minister Farrakhan, Father Flegger, Al Sharpton, not Jesse, nothing against them. They are, they are my personal friends. I love them. But we cannot continue to allow the people that's doing some serious, serious work to go un unlooked. And, and to and go unaided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Maybe they <coughs> not, because yeah, somebody might recognize, okay, that's, that's acknowledgement. After they're dead, we're the most after death people I've ever seen in my life. Hmm. We're going to have a march after the child is dead. We're going to do this after the person is dead. We're the after, the after folks. This, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that word they gave us, the <laughs> year after. <laughs> we don't want to know the after everything is over with. Well, I'll tell know. you one thing. We have had, we have been blessed with leadership. We have had leaders. We have had our share of leaders. We have had our share of saviors. You just don't know a savior when you see one because of the, the Michelangelo's cousin that was painted to be the image of a savior. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. a savior mm -hmm. when you see a savior, when the savior is saving. Mm -hmm. right. We saw Baba Han Hannibal in that role. So we, we know what a Messiah looks like. How many, how do, how many saviors do we have to get? How many leaders do we have to get before we will follow a leader or be saved by a savior? Mm -hmm. If we're not gonna be saved, if we're not gonna follow, then of course we're making a choice. We need to decide on whether or not that's the choice we wanna make. And if that's the choice we wanna make, we don't have to prolong it. We can just hold, 
connect mm -hmm. hands and walk on into the lake mm -hmm. if we just want to be suicidal. But I don't think we have to be because Baba Hannibal has left. I looked at his daughters and I say, yes, he, the, he certainly has left himself in them. Oh, yeah. And so I know that his work will go on, but still the work that he wasn't able to do is left unfinished. And so yeah, I know you always want to do everything at the same time, and I congratulate you for it, and, and don't, don't, uh, don't let us have to do reflection on your <laughs> life too soon. But I appreciate you, Jamelia. I appreciate you. I Rashid, you. I appreciate you, Charles, for coming to help us pay this tribute. I'm going to hear you. <laughs>